Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode five of The Echo Chamber, the podcast where we go over all of the books that we have covered on our primary YouTube channel over at Echo Worm. You can find us at Echo Worm, just spell worm with an I. Why? I don't know. I stole that from Spider Harrison. That's not an original joke of mine. But uh, Echo Worm with an I if you guys are interested in listening to any of these books. Of course, Harry Potter, for copyright reasons, we do not have over on our YouTube channel. But you can find them for free, all seven books, including a re-record of the first book as the Philosopher's Stone rather than the Sorcerer's Stone, over at Patreon for free, patreon.com slash Echo Worm. Again, worm spelt with an I. Or you can find them on Vimeo by searching just for Echo Worm. But today we are on our fifth installment of the podcast talking about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's or Philosopher's Stone. Today's set of chapters, we have another set of three. We're going to talk about chapters 11, 12, and 13. Those chapters are titled Quidditch, The Mirror of Erised, and Nicholas Flamel. This is kind of the middle section of the book where things at Hogwarts are now established and we are really kind of diving into not just life at Hogwarts, but the mystery going on surrounding Harry and his friends, and we propel into kind of the final section of chapters that we'll talk about on our next episode. But today we're going to start with chapter 11. So where we picked up in the last episode was with Halloween. Now, if you've seen the films, you'll be familiar with the Halloween scene as well. It's very similar, not a lot changes, but... A troll is let loose in the castle, and Hermione, having been kind of put down by Ron earlier in the day, disappears. She's in a bathroom, kind of crying about the fact that she doesn't really have any friends, and Harry and Ron, realizing that she's in danger with the troll in the castle, go and save her. Of course, they're discovered by teachers, Hermione takes the blame, and the end of the chapter talks about them now becoming friends. So we start chapter 11, titled Quidditch with all three of them friends. And what is going on in this chapter is kind of a pickup from the last couple, where Harry is the youngest seeker in nearly a century. He is the only first year playing on any of the the Hogwarts Quidditch teams through the various houses. He is starting seeker, only seeker now, for Gryffindor. And they have their first match coming up against Slytherin. So the season begins, and Harry is borrowing a book titled Quidditch Through the Ages. Now, this is actually a an in-universe canon world book that exists. You can physically buy this book. I have recorded it on the channel. You can find it, like I said, over on Patreon and Vimeo for free if you'd like to read it. Uh, it just it, It's kind of a textbook talking about the history of Quidditch, the rules of Quidditch, um, and just various things like that. It's very similar to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them as well. Um, But it's another one of those kind of expansive world books in the Harry Potter universe. But Harry borrows the book and is learning about Quidditch, uh, and Snape finds them with it and confiscates the book because the the kind of enmity between Harry and Snape has been growing, uh, and Snape confiscates the book. But then in their interaction, Harry notices that Snape is walking with a limp. Now, this is really the first time that Harry has seen Snape since the troll was let out of the dungeon, and he starts to wonder why Snape is walking with a limp. And then he kind of overhears Snape talking to Filch about the three-headed dog that they discovered earlier in the book, and Harry starts to piece together that maybe Snape is the one that's trying to steal the object that is hidden within the castle. And so he gets really suspicious of Snape, and things further ramp up as we move into the first Quidditch match. So the Quidditch match happens. Harry is playing the position of Seeker, and is very much what happens in the film version of the book. If you've seen the film, of course, the the Quidditch match goes on. Um, Harry finds the Snitch. He's battling with the the Seeker from Slytherin, whose name is escaping me at the moment. It's not Malfoy yet, of course. That happens later on in the second book. Um, But... All of a sudden, Harry's broomstick starts acting up, and he is unable to stay on his broom. It is throwing him back and forth, and everyone's kind of confused by it at first. And then Hagrid makes a comment that says only dark magic could make a broomstick act the way that it's acting. And then Hermione starts looking around, 
and she comes to realize that Snape is uttering something and staring at Harry as this is all going on. And so now Hermione gets suspicious that Snape is actively trying to kill Harry during this Quidditch match. So she disappears, she goes over to where the where Snape is sitting and sets his robe on fire. This all happens in the film as well. Snape gets distracted, the curse lifts, and Harry gets back on his broomstick. Then he manages to find the snitch and in going to catch it, accidentally trips over his broomstick and swallows, or nearly swallows this snitch. He basically catches it in his mouth and spits it out. Which comes up later on in the series, but it's not necessarily important for now. The big thing is that Harry won the match for Gryffindor. There's some comedic stuff going on with, with the Weasley twins and their friend Lee Jordan, who is the commentator of the match. But Hermione and Ron are now also suspicious of Snape when it comes to Harry. So we don't really know what's going on with Snape, or why he hates Harry, or why he would be be cursing Harry on the Quidditch pitch. And they bring this up with Hagrid. They head over to Hagrid's after the match, and Harry kind of drops all of his suspicions on Hagrid and, and says that he thinks Snape is the one trying to go after the, the hidden object. And Hagrid doesn't quite let them know exactly what's hidden inside the castle, but Hagrid has a bad habit of kind of supplanting information that he maybe shouldn't give to other people. And in this interaction to end this chapter, Hagrid is talking about Fluffy, the three-headed dog, and how what the dog is guarding is a secret that really is a matter dealt with by Albus Dumbledore and his friend Nicholas Flamel, and that's how we end the chapter. So this is kind of exactly what happens in the film for the most part. Uh, I will constantly reference the film. I do apologize if that gets annoying, but most people have seen the film and have not read the book. Um, and so I, I, I try to avoid spoilers on this podcast, but if you have seen the film, uh, it's very, it's an easy way to visualize what's going on. And so I, I will reference it several times throughout this podcast. But that's how we end the chapter. Harry's suspicious of Snape, Hagrid rejects the idea of Snape going after what is hidden in the castle, but he gives up information that says that Dumbledore knows about it, and so does Nicholas Flamel. And so that's chapter 11. So we enter chapter 12 now, the Mirror of Erised, with the idea in the back of our minds, who is Nicholas Flamel? And so they go about, uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione go about looking for him, trying to figure out where they've heard that name before, because Harry is very, very sure that he has recognized that name before, but he can't place it. So in this chapter, we start with that, and also the fact that Christmas is coming. And Hogwarts students have the option, as is the case with most boarding schools during holidays, where the students can stay, or they can go back to their families. And Harry really... A doesn't want to go back to the Dursleys, and, and B doesn't really have the option to go back to the Dursleys, so he is intending to stay at Hogwarts. Uh, Ron is also staying at Hogwarts. I believe, I, I am drawing a blank here, but I believe it's because his parents are visiting Charlie in Romania on the holiday, and so Ron and his siblings are also staying there. But Hermione is going back home. So, with Hermione leaving, and Harry and Ron staying, there are idea of searching for Nicholas Flamel in the library is kind of put on a hold. On Christmas Day, we get this scene that we see in the film where Harry is awoken to Christmas presents, and he's never really received Christmas presents before. So this is a, a big kind of joy to him, and this is, this is the scene and the atmosphere that most people would consider this book, or even specifically this film, as, as somewhat of a Christmas movie. It's kind of got that atmosphere to it, mostly based around this scene and the emotions of this scene. Harry is gifted his very first Christmas jumper, or Christmas sweater, from Ron's mother, who does this. Every year it becomes kind of an in-joke within um, the Weasley siblings and, and within the book itself. But apart from that, he also receives gifts from his friends and kind of an anonymous an anonymous gift of an invisibility cloak. And this is something that is mentioned by Ron to be extremely rare. Not impossible, but very, very rare. And the rarity of this cloak specifically comes up later on in the series, which we'll talk about when we talk about the Deathly Hallows. But this invisibility cloak is 
basically just a, a big, big cloak that he can throw over himself and turn invisible. It's one of the more famous um, magical objects in the series. I'd be surprised if you'd never heard of it before. But if you're brand new to Harry Potter, this is your introduction to the invisibility cloak. Invisibility cloak, rather. So that night, Ron falls asleep, Harry's on his own, and now having an invisibility cloak to help him on his way with an anonymous note telling him to use it wisely. Harry gets the idea to continue searching for Nicholas Flamel, so he goes into the library. They're pretty sure that they've searched everything except the restricted section. Now, the restricted section of the Hogwarts library is specifically for students of age, which are essentially sixth and seventh years, or if you have a very specific note from a teacher with good reason to be in there. Harry goes in there, and he is looking for a book on Nicholas Flamel. And we kind of get this scene in the film, too. He opens the book. There's the screaming book. Um, he drops his lantern, and Filch basically tracks him down. To escape Filch, it's very similar to what happened earlier with the Midnight Duel. Harry is basically just running from room to room. Instead of finding Fluffy this time, though, he finds an empty classroom that only includes a mirror. And in this mirror... Harry starts to see things. On the outside of the mirror is carved the word Erised. Or uh, it includes a, a long inscription that ends with the word Erised. Erised, if you don't have it written in front of you, you might may not be able to tell this, but Erised is the word desire spelled backwards. And so what, what the mirror says around, I am paraphrasing here, but basically the mirror message is in reverse the phrase... Um, this mirror shows you whatever you desire, essentially. And so Harry looks in the mirror, and all of a sudden he starts seeing people appear behind him. And he starts to freak out, and it's kind of a, a scary scene when you're watching it, or you're reading it in the book. You don't quite get that sensation in the film. But Harry kind of freaks out because there's all these ghosts behind him, these people that are just hovering over his shoulder through the mirror. But then as more people appear, he starts to realize that the people in the mirror are very similar in look to himself. And Harry starts to piece together that the people he's seeing in the mirror, especially the ones standing next to him, are his family. And so all of these cousins and aunts and uncles and, and grandparents that have all deceased, right, because the Dursleys are Harry's only living relatives. This is, this is true in canon. All of his relatives are appearing to him in the mirror. And so for the very first time, at least that he can remember, Harry is seeing his mother and father. And then we, of course, get this, this beautiful scene of him trying to interact with them. It's very melancholy because he can't touch them, he can't reach them. But he can only communicate with them basically by signals and waving and, and gestures and whatnot. And he stays there a bit just to soak it all in. And he runs back home, or he runs back to the common room. And the next day, Harry tries to show Ron... So they, they rediscover the chamber with the Mirror of Erised, and he brings Ron with him. And he goes, look, there's my family. And Ron goes, well, I don't see your family, but I see myself winning the Quidditch Cup or winning the House Cup. But then Harry's very confused because he sees his family. Ron sees something completely different, and he doesn't quite put together what's going on. The next night... Ron's afraid of being caught again. Uh, they, they almost get caught the night before with Mrs. Norris, the Filch's cat. But the third night, Ron doesn't come with, but Harry goes by himself again. And instead of being alone this time, he finds Dumbledore, and Dumbledore is waiting for him, basically explaining what the mirror is and what the mirror does. And he doesn't shame Harry necessarily. He, he understands Harry's need to feel connected with his family. And we get the very first real interaction between Dumbledore and Harry. And this is a very impactful conversation between the pair of them. Because of the fact that Dumbledore reveals something about his backstory that seems very innocuous the first time that you read it. And the more that we learn about them, especially when we get into books 6 and 7, we start to understand things about Dumbledore's backstory and what this interaction kind of retroactively means um, when we take a look at Dumbledore's life and the things that we know about Dumbledore's life, 
But he basically explains to Harry that this mirror allows the person in it to see their, their heart's desire. So Harry sees his family reunited. Uh, Ron sees himself being successful because, of course, Ron's backstory is he's got five older siblings. He is the sixth son in a family of seven. His parents very obviously wanted a girl, and he was born, and he has never received the recognition that all of his older brothers did. And so Ron sees himself getting that recognition. And Dumbledore explains this to Harry and explains that this will be the last time Harry has the opportunity to ever see the mirror because the mirror is going to a new location. We will see the mirror by the end of the book. And Harry is disappointed in this, but recognizes what Dumbledore is, is trying to kind of protect him from, I guess. And with that, Harry then asks Dumbledore a simple question. He says, Dumbledore, or, sir, what do you see when you look in the mirror? That, that's all I want to know, is, is what do you see when you look in this mirror? And Dumbledore gives kind of a bizarre answer, and he says, I see myself getting a new pair of socks. He's at, he's at Christmas, and he gets a new pair of socks. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about Dumbledore's family in the Deathly Hallows, but it's a very interesting interaction to have foreshadowed going ahead. But that's essentially how this chapter ends. We move on to chapter 13. So we've gone through Quidditch, we've gone through the Mirror of Eris, and now we really dig into Nicholas Flamel. Who is Nicholas Flamel? We kind of find out in this chapter. So Hermione's back, the holidays are done, and Harry is no longer able to see the Mirror of Erised. So when Hermione comes back, they continue to search and search and search for Nicholas Flamel. Although Harry becomes increasingly frustrated by the fact that he is not able to spend as much free time as he wants with his friends because he has homework and he has Quidditch and he really wants to figure out who Nicholas Flamel is because he feels it's important, but he's just too busy. I think most of us can relate to that at some point in our lives. And then Harry learns that at their next match, Snape is going to be the referee. They're having a guest referee. Snape is going to be referee for the next Quidditch match. And he starts to freak out. Uh, he's he's worried that Snape's going to try to kill him again, it, it, especially what happened last time, what, what they saw happen last time. And Harry gets increasingly nervous. He was very nervous about his first match, but now that Snape is involved in the second one, he continues to be very, very, very nervous. This interesting section happens in the middle of that, where Neville appears having been tied up by Malfoy. Malfoy basically casts a spell on, on Neville, bullying him, that, that locks his legs together. And Harry basically tells Neville to learn to stand up for himself. And Neville is like, all right, I'll, I'll do that next time, whatever. And this kind of foreshadows something later on in the book. But uh, Harry, having been kind of starting this this wizarding card collection since the beginning of the book when they when he met Ron on the train, Neville, knowing this, gives Harry a card of his that he had gotten a chocolate frog. He's already got it, whatever. And Harry suddenly remembers where he knows the name Nicholas Flamel from. And he checks his card collection. And so he goes back to, to check his card collection, and he's got the trading card for Albus Dumbledore, the same one that, that Ron gave him on the train. And he reads it, and he learns that Dumbledore had a partner at one point in his career named Nicholas Flamel, who was the only known creator of something called the Philosopher's Stone, or the Sorcerer's Stone, depending where you are in the world. So they learn that in, in reading about this, they learn that the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosopher's Stone is an alchemical device which allows the user to transform any metal into gold. Basically, it gives you the King Midas touch. And it also allows you to produce an elixir of everlasting life. So I want to pause for a second and talk just a little bit about Nicholas Flamel. So Nicholas Flamel, uh, as opposed to basically every other character in Harry Potter, uh, of course we get mentions of of Merlin, we get Morgan Le Fay mentioned later on in the series, but in terms of actual, like, importance to the plot of the entire series, Nicholas Flamel is kind of the only real character that we have that comes from the real world. And what I mean by that is Nicholas Flamel was actually not even just a legendary character. Like, Merlin was a legendary character. There, there is no actual proof that he ever existed outside of the, the King Arthur legendarium. 
which has existed for thousands, if not if not more than a thousand, thirteen hundred years or so. Nicolas Flamel actually existed. He, he lived in the thirteen hundreds, the, the the fourteenth century. He was a French, um, basically inscriptioner. He he worked in churches. He made artwork for churches. He he did all of this kind of script writing essentially he, he f created fonts essentially um but he was also known as kind of a scientific mind at the time of course over the years especially by the time we get to the 1600s and the 1700s he kind of develops this legendary history about himself um just kind of created out of the into the french revolution kind of out of this i don't even know how to describe it french gothic era you could argue um where History was rewritten to say that Nicolas Flamel was an alchemist who was trying to search for the elixir of life, and rumor has it he created it and he's disappeared, and he's still alive and he's going to live forever, whatever. This is a real thing that happened. This is a real legendary event that happened, not the elixir of life necessarily, but Nicolas Flamel was a real person, and a real legendary history has been created outside of him. And so he is the only character in Harry Potter that was a real person and has this kind of legendary thing built around him. Of course, now we uh, there, there's a book series that you guys have been asking me to read for a while called uh, the, the Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas Flamel. I'll get to it eventually on the channel. Unrelated to Harry Potter, but has to do with the life and secrets um, and kind of legendary history of Nicholas Flamel. But he appears in Harry Potter. He is a character in Harry Potter who actually did create the elixir of life, the sorcerer's stone. And so they discover this. Hermione and Harry and Ron put this together and come to this conclusion that that is what's being hidden within the castle. So this is kind of sidetracked by the fact that the Quidditch match comes up. And if Gryffindor wins, then they'll be at the top of the house leaderboard. Harry's freaking out about Snape being the referee. And then he starts to kind of relax when he realizes that Dumbledore is going to be at the game. So Dumbledore kind of at this point in the book is this grand figure, but after his interaction in the last chapter, and especially in this chapter now after that, has kind of become this weighted blanket, this, this blanket of protection over Harry. And so with Dumbledore being there, Harry is convinced that Snape won't do anything. He kind of relaxes a little bit and he catches the snitch in five minutes. And it's like the fastest Quidditch victory that they've seen in Hogwarts in, in forever. And Dumbledore comes down to the field to congratulate Harry. And as the game comes to a close and all of his friends are leaving, Harry sees Snape walk off from the pitch, not back to the castle, but over to the Forbidden Forest. Now, the Forbidden Forest is off limits to students. But Harry takes his broom kind of outside of the view of everyone else and flies over the forest, and he tries to get as close as he can. And what he overhears is Snape in the forest, talking to Professor Quirrell. And with all the suspicions that Harry and Hermione and Ron have about Professor Snape, Harry starts to piece together that he was right, that Snape is really trying to go after this device, which he now believes to be the Sorcerer's Stone. He believes the stone is what's hidden in the castle, Snape's going after it, and he believes that Snape has really, really dark intentions with it, and that somehow Snape's hatred for him is linked to it. And so that's where we end with this chapter. And so it's, it's an interesting set of three chapters where we get some very emotional moments, especially in the middle there, um, and just views in the friendship of Harry and Hermione and Ron. We see more of the suspicions with Snape and, and with everything going around, and we really get the introduction that we needed to Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore is not just this grand principal figure of the school. Albus Dumbledore comes off to Harry as a caring mentor and a friend, and we'll see much more of that going forward. But that's where we stand at the end of chapter 13, with Harry growing increasingly suspicious of Snape, believing he is after the stone, believing the stone is what's hidden in the castle, and something bad is about to happen as we enter the final four chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So that's where we'll leave it today. Again, if you want to reach out, if you have any questions you want covered on the podcast at any point, feel free to drop them if you're listening to this live or later on on YouTube. Drop them in the comments section. If you want things answered and you're listening over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can email me at echoworm, that's worm spelt with an I, 
at gmail.com. Otherwise, check out our Patreon and Vimeo accounts. Like I said, all of our Harry Potter content is available for free. You shouldn't need to sign up for it. Patreon.com slash Echoworm. But that's all we have for today. We'll see you in two weeks to talk about the final four chapters of the first book in Harry Potter. <laughs>